So why do so many children and adults become obese? This question isn't so uninteresting because in Germany right now they are 75% of the men overweight and 80% of the women and unfortunately 15% of our children. So why? It's a weakness of character, many say. This notion goes back to the Middle Ages when um, excessive eating was considered one of the deadly sins. You see here a picture that was how, this, how the Italian poet Dante describes in his Inferno how the sinners here suffer in everlasting rain. And Dante approaches one of them here and asks him, why, why are you here? And he says, it's the pernicious sin of gluttony. Fortunately, in the 50s, 1950s of last century, first attempt were ma attempts were made to stop that stigmatization of obese people. It was Jean Mayer, one of the most renowned physiologists in the last century, who said, it's the energy need of the body. Well, the idea is very simple. He set up the first cybernetic model, as you can see here. He says, it's the blood glucose, so the fill content of energy in the body, it's the blood glucose which determines, determines how much we eat. So, if blood glucose is low, we eat more, and if blood glucose is high, the brain gives command to eat less. This was a very good model and it could explain a lot of data, however there was one shortcoming in it and Jean Mayer at that time was aware of it. Uh, it was that he could not answer the simple question, uh, why do patients with diabetes eat at all? Because they dis display high blood glucose and they should not eat, they should stop according to that model. And he spent 20 years of his scientific life but he could not answer that question. Nevertheless, he became very influential. He started in the 70s to uh, put his model into health politics. And he was advisor of three American presidents and made the, the most important nutritional programs for undernutrition and overnutrition in the world. And maybe, I don't know, but maybe the spread of obesity has something to do with this little shortcoming in that model. And what is the solution to the shortcoming? Uh, you can see it here on this picture. Uh, it's the need of the brain, the high energy need of the brain that is important. You see this is a starving baby here, and what is obvious, it has a large head, or a normal head, but a very small body. And the same phenomenon is also true in, in the premature babies. They have this tiny body, but a normal brain and we call this downsizing of the body. It's a program that spares the energy here and keeps it for the brain. So the brain has a very high energy need and it actively demands it from the body. And in times of crisis, it behaves selfish, in a selfish manner. And you can see the selfishness in this picture here. This is a human, and what is black is marked glucose. It's marked with a radioactive marker, and you can see most of the glucose enters the brain. And as you're sitting here in this audience, uh, two-thirds of your circulating glucose enters your brain. But in my case, it's... I would have said 95%, but as I know that I'm broadcasted, I say it's 99% of the glucose <laughs> entering my brain. <laughs> In 1987, I had the opportunity to go to Toronto and had to solve my first metabolic problem. I had a scholarship of the German Research Foundation at that time, and uh, I remember it was a spring morning, I walked through downtown Toronto, through the streets, and I stopped at a traffic light, and uh, there was a crossing, large crossing. Cars were coming from the left, and then there was a red light, and the other cars were going into that direction. And uh, I thought, well, could it be that in metabolism, in human organism, there is something like a street light, and there is one street heading for the brain, 
and one street to the body. And I thought, that could it be? Maybe there is a traffic light switch somewhere in the body and uh, we've got to find it. And I went right away to, to my lab, put out a book and that was of control theory and I saw there was a regulation scheme of a traffic light and that exactly fitted to the problem I had to solve. But then time went by and like 11 years in 1998, uh, meanwhile I became an internist and endocrinologist, professor of medicine and uh, I had to work on a different problem and that was why do so many children and adults become obese. And in these 11 years, many data had been produced and many important things had been found, and I had them all on my desk, all these data, and tried to, to figure out how they were working together. It was so complicated. And uh, then it came to my mind there was this old Toronto idea with the traffic light. I put out the old book and had it here, the traffic light scheme, And I said, well, that's very easy. Let's put it here and there and there. And it worked. It became very, very simple. And that was the moment the selfish brain theory was born. Uh, the selfish brain theory says the brain serves itself first. And I formulated the axioms. And uh, I talked to many specialists in the world, leaders of the field, uh, like leader of the field of obesity research and stress research, neurobiology, emotional learning, emotional memory, sleep, even economics. And in 2004, the German Research Foundation founded a large research group, uh, which I'm leading in, uh, at the University of Lübeck, and there are 36 scientists and 50 PhD students just working on the question of the selfishness of the brain in human metabolism. So, um, Keep in mind, the brain is the principal consumer in the body and the main flux is directed to the brain. But what happens, it happens if there is a bottleneck in supply somewhere here? Then the brain is in trouble. It has not enough energy. Bottleneck, build up. So these are terms we know from traffic analysis. And at that time, I talked to Professor Dirk Langemann, he's a mathematician, he's also an expert in traffic analysis, and he explains to me, you know, that's very easy. If you're sitting in one of those cars, you're approaching traffic jam, you come to a stop, you get out of the car, and you ask yourself, what is the cause of this jam? And well, you're expecting the cause somewhere in front of you but you don't come to the idea to look in the luggage space or even behind the car. Uh, that sounds very trivial, I know. But in obesity research, scientists have always looked for many, many decades within the traffic jam. They have looked in the liver, in the pancreas, in the muscle, in the fat tissue, but that's within the accumulation, within the buildup. You should look ahead. Where does the energy go? And it goes to the brain. So, Together with Dirk Langemann, we looked at the supply chain of the human brain. And he's also an expert in supply chains, or distribution chains, as we heard before. And uh, in this field of logistics, we have many laws. And he, on the one side, had the laws of economics, and I, on the other hand, had uh, the medical and biological data. And we put this thing together, and this took us two years. So the energy, as you can see, flows from the environment through the body to the brain as the final consumer. If the brain needs energy, it says, let's get it from the body. And we call this force with which, with which the brain actively demands energy from the body, the brain pull, as you can see here. And the brain pull is so important. The brain pull is at work in these small babies. You know, if there is a crisis, no nutrition, uh, the brain takes away the energy from the body and the body shrinks. But this guarantees the survival of the baby. So the brain pull is a good thing. And the brain pull protects us from gaining weight in times when there is abundance of food, food available. If the body lacks energy, it says, let's get it from the environment, from the table. And this is body pull, not brain pull, but body pull. But a better word for that is eating. <laughs> <laughs> and
And if the table or the fridge is empty, we have to go and buy something from the market. We call this foraging pull to go and search for food. But what happens if there is a bottleneck somewhere here? If this brain pull is not working, there could be a disease somehow. And uh, then the brain is in trouble. It says, I don't have enough energy. So what to do? And it gives command to get it from the outside, from, from the table, and to increase eating. But then you can see that very clear if you get much into the body and then only give a fraction to the brain, there will be a buildup. Like this. <laughs> And if energy accumulates in the fat tissue, we call this obesity, and if energy accumulates in the blood vessels in form of glucose, we call this diabetes. But now you ask yourself, what is this brain pull? Um, how can it be disturbed? And there, there are at least 30 different causes. And to, to summarize them, um, it's like a computer. So the brain pull is no switch you can put on and off. It's much more complicated. It's working in a complex neural network, and that's this place in amygdala, which is the most complicated structure in the universe we have, the human amygdala. And this area in the brain generates the brain pull. So it's rather a computer equipped with a software. If your computer is not working, it might be a hardware problem, software problem, or false signal like a virus. And the same is true if we look at the amygdala and these areas in the brain with generation of the brain pull. Um, there could be hardware failures, but to make it short, they are really rare. There could be a tumor or a rare gene defect. Let's forget it. Only a few numbers in the world. But the epidemic, that has something to do with the software. But just to mention the false signals, um, a non-caloric sweetener, that's a false signal, because it's chemistry. It's a chemical substance which tastes sweet. And if you eat it, it announces to your brain that glucose is coming. And glucose is sweet plus energy. But after 10 minutes, your brain says, well, where's my glucose coming? <laughs> it's just chemistry. And uh, it, if this happens very often, it changes its strategy and says, I have to order more eating, because then I'm on the same, safe side. I, I get my energy. And Davidson did it in uh, animals, and he could show uh, that if you fool them with faked sweet energy, uh, they, these animals gain weight. But as I mentioned, the software programming is far more important. And I think the most important factor that causes obesity is a brain pull failure that arises from the adaption to chronic stress. So when chronically stressed, people react in two different patterns. The one half of people, when chronically stressed, they eat less and lose weight. And the other half, they eat more and gain weight. And the first half, they are of the type like an actor who comes to stage and has fright, uh, uh, stage fright every time, so repeatedly, even if he grows older. And he's the type who does not adapt with his strength, stress response. He keeps it high all the time. And he's the type who loses weight. He takes the energy he needs during the performance from the body, losing weight after. But the other people who gain weight, they are of the opposite type. They tune down their stress response time by time. They calm down, even though there is chronic stress. But their brain is in trouble, because the high energy demand of the brain is still there. And they tune down their brain full function. So they have to eat more to fuel their brain and then they got the build-up and they gain weight. So the adaption with the chronic, to chronic stress, with the stress response, that's the most frequent thing. But there is another thing that, um, that is a problem uh, that concerns our children. You can also program uh, the brain pull with food advertising. So when children uh, have 
a table with sweets in front of them, and they watch a TV program um, that is interrupted by food ads. Then they eat 45% more than if the program consists of toy ads. So, and this is really uh, what, what makes me nervous. Let's summarize. What makes us stay slim? The answer is simple. It's the brain pull. And what should we do to stop the obesity epidemic? We must take care to protect the brain pull in our children. Thank you very much.